Scripture today is from 2 Kings chapter 4, 1 through 7. The widow's oil. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elijah, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elijah replied to her, How can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a little oil. Elijah said, Go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go, then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. She left, left him and afterwards shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, Bring me another one. But he replied, There is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. May God bless our understanding to the reading of his word. This two-part sermon was inspired by this story of a man who made a life-size portrait of his son. And when he died, many came to bid on his extensive art collection. But the auctioneer said, the first painting we have to bid on is the pa painting of the son. Didn't seem very valuable to many of them that were there. You know the story, one woman who had helped to care for the son way in the back. Couldn't really afford it, but she bid $1,000. And he said, sold to the lady in the back. Step back, close this book. <laughs> said, and ladies and gentlemen, now the auction is over because the owner also stipulated that whoever gets the son gets everything. Everything. Whoever gets the son gets everything. And we know that in Christ we do get everything. Uh, so this two-part sermon is about being enough, David, and having enough, the widow's oil. And if that man felt that way about his son, think how God must feel about his son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we're still saying the same thing together today. Whoever gets Jesus gets everything. I've got Jesus, and that's enough. Thank God I'm in a Jesus church this morning. Amen. I'm so happy to have um, Caleb play for us. So fond of him and his dad being with us. Reverend Date surprised me this morning. Good to see you. Good to see everybody. Elder Donna, I hadn't seen her in a while. And all of you, Sister Judy, this sermon is dedicated to you because you said on Bible study once, Judy, you said in Bible study once that you liked a sermon that went verse by verse, and I finally got a sermon for you this morning. <laughs> One that goes verse by verse. <laughs> Last Sunday, I focused on the story of David and Goliath as a biblical example of being enough. In 1 Samuel 17, three people told David that he was not enough. They said he wasn't good enough, he was evil, he wasn't old enough, and he wasn't equipped enough to go against the nine-foot giant Goliath. His older brother said, your heart is evil. What are you doing here? King Saul told him, you're a child. You can't go up against this giant. He's been a warrior for most of his life. And finally, Goliath said to him, am I a dog? You come out here with a stick? You're not equipped enough. I'm going to feed you to the birds of the air and the wild animals of the field. But you remember from last night, David was fearless. David persevered. And a couple of you commented that it's going to be young people who are going to solve the great uh, problems of our world today, and I agree with you, but only if they do it in the name of the Lord. And our challenge is how to reach and teach the faith to future generations. 
I'm glad we do have a few kids in the back, Anna's kids. And I'm glad Caleb is here. We got a few young people. Last Sunday, I had Reverend Bev's niece here to talk to. But I like talking to young people because I think it is going to take them. Like a young J David, probably a teenager, when he did this. But we must find a way to let them know that the way into the kingdom is through Jesus Christ. And I told you I wasn't quite finished that sermon because I wanted to come back to that stone. David used a stone, one stone and a slingshot to slay the enemy and to get the victory. This, is a, this stone prefigures and represents Christ. Listen to Daniel 2, 35. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Verse 44. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall not be destroyed, nor shall this kingdom be left to another people. It shall crush all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. And I hear the Lord's Messiah, and he shall reign forever and ever. His kingdom is without end. And that kingdom is the kingdom of Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God and its righteousness. Sometimes we call it the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, we must teach and convince the youth of today that only what they do for Christ will last. And if we do, and if they believe, they will slay giants and they will overcome evil. Praise God for it. Amen. I believe it's going to happen. Amen. But today I want to turn my attention to another representation of Christ and his kingdom. It's the pouring of the widow's oil in 2 Kings 4. Like 1 Samuel 17, it's a situation in which there is desperation, this time in the life of a widow, the wife of a prophet. Her husband has died, and she's on the verge of selling her two children into slavery to pay her debts. She has no other means of survival for herself or for them. Now in those days, according to Jewish custom, to satisfy an unpaid debt, children could be sold to work for the debtor for six years. Then in the seventh year, they had to be set free. But you mind how sleepless nights she had worried that she'd have to give her children away into labor like that. Regrettably, she saw no other way out. But let's go line by line. Second Kings 4 and 1. Now the wife of a member of the company of the prophets cried to Elisha, your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know your servant feared the Lord. But a creditor has come to take my two children as slaves. Here she invokes her husband's name because he was a student of Elisha, a prophet. He's part of his school of the prophets. Now, no teacher expects your student or mentee to die before you, before you do. So she's appealing to him as his mentor. A couple dozen students I have worked with in ministry have died and gone on to glory. And the older I get, the more I remember them, and I call their names in prayer, and I keep that list nearby because I love my students, and it moves me that they are gone. And I hope and imagine that when I get to glory, they'll be part of the welcoming delegation for me. I'm looking forward to that. Amen. Yes, this widow of 2 Kings reminds Elisha her husband feared the Lord. He was a good man. You see, Elisha himself had a mentor. Remember, he was Elijah with the J-A-H on the end. He had anointed him and given him his start, and the student asked for a double portion of Elijah's anointing. 
And now the widow is asking Elisha to release his prophetic gift to help her avoid selling her children into slavery. You know, God sends the prophets to illuminate the situation and to show us the way out. Amen. Praise God. Now let's look at verse 2. Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? Miracles are made of ordinary things, things that are close by, right at our disposal, everyday things. Today, we need to see what's in our house that God can use to change the world for good. It could be a stick in your hand, like Moses. It could be two fish and five loaves of bread, like a boy's lunch. Amen. It could be a simple meal like the Lord's Supper. Yeah. It could be a stone. Thank you. It could be your youngest son, like David. It could be your cousin, like Esther. Somebody in your house that's going to save the nation. So think about it. It's important. What do you have in your house? And she answered, your servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. It could have been like cooking oil, you know, we kept on the stove after we cooked the bacon. There was a jar. Who remembers? It was tin. It was a tin can in my household. Hallelujah. Or it could have been the anointing oil that her husband used, like when Samuel came to anoint Saul or to anoint David. The oil. It was the only thing left. But it was going to be more than enough. More than enough. It's not what you lost, my friends. It's what do you have left. Look in your house. Go home and look in your house. Take a look. Something in there that God can use. Hallelujah. And now the verse 3. He, Elisha said, go outside, borrow vessels from all your neighbors, empty vessels, and not just a few. Mm. It was embarrassing enough that she already had borrowed a lot because that's why she's got to sell her children. She owes so many people so much money. And here the prophet is telling her to borrow something else. But it's a kind of easy ask because she's borrowing empty containers. Might not mind parting with some empty containers, amen? Say, go ask for empty containers, not a cup of sugar. You don't want what's in the container. You just want the container. Not half full, not a third full, empty. Empty containers because something special was going to go in those vessels. It was a strange thing to ask for, but she'd come this far, so she's going to do what he asked. You know, sometime in the spiritual realm, God asked her to do some strange things. That's why we need the prophets. It's the spirit moves through them. Went to Boston to minister to a woman with Alzheimer's last week. And uh, I didn't know. I never know. You never know when you're going in a situation how God's going to use you or what to do. You just pray and lean on the Lord. And I didn't have anything special with me. But someone had given her, Sister Jackie, adult coloring book and some coloring pencils. And so I was just inspired to see if she could color. She'd been an artist. Somebody mentioned them and pulled them out. And first I took one out and I was showing her how to color. And then she wasn't responding. She's clutched like this. She wouldn't open her hands or let you touch her. So somebody just said, take all the colors out. Lay them all out in front of her. And so I did, and so I said to her, which one is your favorite color? Because I know one thing about art, color is exciting. And for, it took her a while, but after a while, she opened her hand and she pointed, she started pointing at the colors, and I started asking her questions. 
and she's pointing at the colors. And after a while, uh, she said to me, her hands were cold because she had difficulty. She hadn't held in her hand anything in her hands for a long time, so she was having a lot of difficulty holding it. So I took her hand and I just rubbed her. I said, you know, my hands are always warm. That's the truth. Amen. Elder Darlene knows when we pray up here, I've always got warm hands. And so I just started rubbing her hands. And after a while, she was able to color a little something. She did something she had never done for others. Sometimes it's the simplest thing. It's the strangest thing that God uses. We had a moment. We had a special breakthrough. And then her sister called me and said, you know, God really used you to minister to her. I said, yeah, I had a connection. I had a moment with her. I couldn't have made that up. I couldn't have known that that's what I had to do. Amen. But that's just how God works. And another thing, God still needs empty vessels to fill. Elisha said, borrow the empty vessels, lots of them. And he says, this filling is going to be special oil, valuable oil. You know, like extra virgin olive oil? Not to be contaminated with other things, because they're going to sell this and she's going to pay her debts. I thought of that prayer, Lord, I come as an empty vessel before a full fountain. But some of us are not empty enough yet for God to fill us, for us to receive God's, the richness of God's filling. You see, it's better if we come to God empty, not knowing the way, not having the answer, putting aside our ideas and our notions, exhausting all our options. We come hungry looking for bread. We come thirsty looking for drink. Only then can God fill us with the best things. We must be empty ourselves before the Lord to receive a miracle. We must surrender our will and our way. I had to work many evenings, was often not home for dinner with my daughters. They drew, grew up on frozen dinners. My husband was gone most of the time with the Navy, and they were home too much, left alone entirely too much. But I asked God to raise those girls for me. And they learn how to look out for each other, and they're still very close today because God heard my humble cry. I don't know how. I don't know what made the difference. All I can say is that they made it. They surpass my greatest expectation for each of them. I give God all the glory. So take the time and tell the Lord you don't know. Let him show you the way. Some of us are too full of ourselves. It's only when we have a void and abyss of need that God will work in our lives. When sleep won't resolve the problem, when we're drained, when we've had sleepless nights, when energy is gone, hope is waning, when we're broken and empty vessels, then God will fill us and use us. So on verse 4, Elijah continued, then go in, shut the door behind you and your children, start pouring into all these vessels. Each one is full. When it's full, set it aside. So she left him and shut the door behind her and her children. They kept bringing vessels to her, and she kept pouring. And when the vessels were full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. But he said to her, there are no more then the oil stopped flowing. Can you imagine this woman just pouring? I wonder why the prophet told her to shut the door. You got any ideas on that? I have some. It's only conjecture. You ever in the country and somebody says, shut the door? Don't hear that in the city much. But in the country, you hear a lot, shut the door. Think of, that's that's homework, or that's something you can talk. I got some, let's let's swap ideas on why he told her to shut the door. I, I don't have time to uh, really extrapolate on that, but she kept pouring, and as she poured from vessel to vessel, the oil did not run out. And I thought of how she was asking, and God was giving. She was seeking, and God was 
helping her find. She was knocking and the door was being opened in that hour. How do you think she felt? It's just more and more oil just came out of this jar, this vial. It just never stopped. Well, you see, it too is a representation of Christ, a limitless pouring out. The pouring of this oil prefigured Jesus pouring out his life in his blood. Every time we come to the table, we remember a pouring out. His blood is still being poured out, 2,000, 2,023 years, and his blood is still being poured out. It never runs dry. Somebody said his blood reaches to the highest mountain, flows to the lowest valley. Hallelujah. It will never lose its power. Thank you, Jesus. That oil did not stop flowing until all the vessels were filled. And when there was no other vessel available, it stopped. My friends, it's all about capacity. Capacity. You got to make room for God. God can't fill you if there's no space for him to get in. Amen? You got to empty out so he can come in. You can receive enough to the extent of your capacity. When you make room for God's gifts, God will fill you to overflowing. So get rid of the things that really don't matter and tell him, fill me, Lord. Fill my cup. I lift it up. Come and fill this emptiness of my soul. Bread of heaven, fill me till I want no more. Fill me up. Fill my life with hope. My plans with purpose. My wounds with healing my days with meaning, my future with vision. Fill me, God, with goodness, grace, and provision. Won't he do it? I'm a living witness. He will do it. He will do it. He will do it every time. Hallelujah. And then finally to verse 7. She came and told the man of God everything that had just happened. I'm sure she was so excited. And he said to her, now go sell the oil, and you and your children can live off the rest more than enough. She had enough, not just enough to pay her debts, but thanks to her neighbor's container, she had enough to get out of debt and live, live on it. How many of you want to get out of debt and live on it? Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. I stand here debt free and I praise God. Amen. And I'm living. I'm living a life I love. Living a life I love because his grace is more more than enough. And so do you have more than enough as well as I have more than enough. More more than enough grace, enough peace, enough mercy, enough love. Do I have a witness in here this morning? more than enough. And I just wish I could have been there to see those children when they were taking those vessels back to the neighbors. Hallelujah. Mama said, thank you. Mama said, thank you. Mama said, thank you. It was only a temporary situation. It was only a temporary setback. You see, it was only a borrowed tune that Jesus needed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for more than enough. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. So now we offer to Jesus Christ to you. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things will be added to you. Would you seek the Lord today? Would you empty yourself and have him come and fill your heart with the things of God, the things of that are eternal, putting away the things that are temporary. Fill me, Lord, with the things that are everlasting.